Welcome back to the Kenza Pod, everyone. Today is going to be a really fun and interesting discussion that I think a lot of you are going to enjoy. So this actually, um, the idea for this episode came from another episode. And in this other interview, someone said, emotions don't have a place in business. And I'm totally like missing the con. I'm not going to explain the whole context of that statement or anything like that because it doesn't really matter. It was just something, it was a statement that I really was like, huh, that is an interesting statement. I didn't really place a judgment on it one way or the other. I just, it really stood out to me and kind of stuck with me. Um, So I started to kind of think about it and I started wondering, hmm, what role do emotions play in our business? And is there a way that we can somehow learn to harness their power and um, make smarter, more intuitive decisions? Or is it the opposite, that if we look too much into our emotional reactions, then we can make um, what some might call emotional decisions? Um, So then I thought, huh, is there a time when we really do need to check our emotions at the door? And like, what does that even mean? And what are we even talking about when we're thinking about emotions? And so um, I really started to, as you can see, sort of spiral down this path. And, (laughs) you know, especially as a woman in business, you know, you hear the phrase that women are too emotional, which is just total BS, um, or told to be quit being so emotional. I've literally been told both of those things in my career. So I thought, dear listener, this might be an interesting topic for you as well. And so there's one person, pretty much, I think only one person that popped into my head as the perfect person to talk to us about this. Her name is Kat Lee. She's been on the podcast before. And let me give you a little intro of who she is. And we're going to get going on this. So Kat is a trauma informed spiritual business mentor. Awesome, right? And she is also the host of the Empowered Curiosity podcast. Definitely check that out. She uses the tools of trauma informed somatic and emotional alchemy to guide soulful entrepreneurs to approach their business as a spiritual practice. So like it literally, that literally gave me goosebumps just now. Approaching your business as a spiritual practice. So interesting. And, and her work allows business owners to cultivate businesses that are rooted in conscious values, ethical marketing, and purposeful service. Love all of that. So we've had her on the pod before to talk about the the topic was how to create an abundant business and life by listening to your body. So you can see why she's definitely someone who is the perfect person to talk to about all this. Um, so if you want to check that out, look at um, check out the show notes and definitely uh, recommend you checking that out. So welcome back to the podcast, Kat. We're so happy to have you. I am so, so thrilled to be here. And when you emailed me this question of where do emotions fit into business? I, it was like a whole body. Fuck. Yes. We need to talk about this. (laughs) I think you responded in like a couple of minutes, like all caps. And I was like, Oh, I got it, girl. (laughs) Let's do this. Um, I feel like this is one of the things that I was put on this planet and manifested to talk about because we have this tendency to, and this is sort of our culture nowadays, we have an allopathic way of looking at things. You know, even in our medicine, we look at things as like, you go to your cardiologist for your heart and then you go to your endocrinologist for your hormones, but nobody's really talking about like what the crossover and the links are in between. And For me, I look at everything through the lens of cycles and nature and Taoism and purpose. And we spend, I don't know, 40 plus hours a week for a lot of us in business. So why do we separate who we are, what our purpose is, and essentially like and we'll talk a little bit about this, um, what our Tao is. Why do we check that at the door when it comes to business? And I think that inquiry has led me down this path of really wanting to mentor people who are craving a different way of approaching business. There are so many of us who want to participate within this capitalist system in a way that feels moral and ethical. 
And if we check our emotions at the door, then we don't have our intuition to guide us along that path of how do we do this in a way that's aligned with our values. You know, when we um, check our emotions at the door, we're also checking our bodies, wants, needs, and desires at the door. Mm -hmm. And so we have a tendency to get really burnt out in business because we aren't listening to our bodies when it's saying that's enough for the day. We need to Mm -hmm. shut the computer down. We need to take a rest and then come back to this with clearer eyes tomorrow. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I'm so stoked to have this conversation. Obviously, like, (laughs) I like could not stop talking for like, (laughs) I love it. Well, okay. So I want to come back to, I, I would love for you to explain this concept of the Tao to us, to me. Um, before we get into all of that, I want, can you just do, I know I did a little intro, but I'd love for you to just share a little bit more of your background and, you know, just briefly so we can get into the meat of this and just kind of tell people a little bit of who you are and, and what you do. Yeah. So I spent the first decade of my career as an acupuncturist. And in that process, what I learned is so much about the nervous system. Um, That's essentially what we're doing when we are putting acupuncture needles in someone's body is we're helping their nervous system regulate itself so that we're able to unlock the healing for that patient on their own. Um, And along that path, I couldn't help but get drawn into the world of trauma work. I did a lot of fertility acupuncture, and so we talked a lot about relationships in those spaces. And when 2020 hit and I was no longer allowed to touch people, I transitioned fully to a coaching practice. And so I did relationship and trauma coaching for a couple of years. And what I found in that process were folks who were coming to me looking for mentorship around their business because they knew the things that they had to do. Like, they're like, I know I'm supposed to show up on Instagram X amount of times. I know, like, I've downloaded all these sales templates. I know, you know, how I'm supposed to do this, but there's something that's blocking me from being able to actually do that. Oh my gosh. I feel like I could have literally said that just now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And what I found is that, like, our traumas block us. And so... When we look at business as a spiritual practice, we can then look at these blocks and challenges that are coming up for us in business and be like, oh, this feels really similar to the texture that I feel when I feel blocked in my relationship with my partner or when I feel blocked in my um, conversations with my parents or, you know, this comes a lot for me in friendship as well. So By approaching business as a spiritual practice and and thinking of business as a part of your healing journey and a part of you as an individual learning how to manifest your purpose, like that's how we sort of unlock all the how-tos. We have to go back to the why before we can layer on the how-tos. Does that make sense? Totally. It totally makes sense. And it's, it's so interesting because you know, since talking with you and kind of studying some of the ways you approach business, and um, I really want to start to go deeper in that, because I am noticing those types of things. Like, I keep having these moments where I feel excited to get going on something so inspired, knowing that this could be really cool This whatever it is I'm trying to do. Yeah. And then something happens, you know, I burn out, or I get sick, or a thing happens that makes me question all of it and think, I can't do this. There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. What happens if this works and things get too big and out of my control and I just can't, I just can't do it, you know? And my body responds in this weird way and I keep having these cycles Mm -hmm. and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? And so I (laughs) I can see how, you know, for those of us who were employees at one point and then started our own business, these are the types of things that come up. And if we don't, you know, we talk a lot about the importance of getting, you know, of therapy as something that is like, I think it should be counted as a business expense, you know, like actual therapy, yeah. um, because this is such, such important work to be doing. Mm-hmm. And it, um, it shows up in all kinds of ways in the yeah. clients we attract or don't attract the work Absolutely. we're doing, 
what we do with money, which we're going to talk to later, uh, talk about later on. Um, so just thank you, Kat, for doing this really, really great work, <laughs> helping people. Well, and part of that is because I've been there too, you know, yeah. like mm-hmm. I started my acupuncture practice back in 2011, 2010, somewhere in that range. And just like nobody was talking about how it wasn't enough to just be a good practitioner. Like you had to actually go out there and go get clients and figure out how you wanted to represent yourself. And, and all these fears and these blocks around, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I want to serve everybody, but then I end up serving nobody. And then I end up getting right. burnt out. Like, like nobody was really talking about all these things and how they actually go back to a lot of the survival patterns that, you know, I, we entrepreneurs have adopted in our childhood to find love, trust, and belonging. And if we don't work through those, then our business becomes our teacher in, in mm. allowing us to access those lessons in a different way. Right. And, and so I think about like, I've done so much work in my relationships. It's why I used to teach relationship coaching back in the day. And yet all the same stuff, like, I don't know if any of you all are, are familiar with attachment patterns, but you know, the ways in which I used to attach to my partner in insecurity was to cling and to like to grasp and try to keep them as close as possible to me and try to control all the aspects of all the things. I was doing that in business as well, even though I had resolved all those things in my relationships. Oh, how interesting. And so if we get down to the deeper layers of what happens when your nervous system feels like it's under threat and not fragment those parts, but actually embrace those parts as a part of our survival toolkit and integrate those parts and see what gifts we want to hang on to and what needs to be let go of and what needs to be shed. Mm-hmm. I love that. Okay. So you now, um, with a background of trauma informed, was it, can you say trauma informed and acupuncture practice? Is that sort of what it had shifted into? I guess or? So. <laughs> That a thing. I'm, I'm a manifesting generator. And so like, <laughs> I've done all the things and I've worn all the hats. Um, and I just, I sort of follow my curiosity, but yeah, I was an acupuncturist and then I transitioned into fertility acupuncture and then transitioned into relationship and trauma coaching. And then now I'm a spiritual business coach. And I think cool. that all of my past lives actually are able to come into fruition and and I get to share them as tools in the business world now for, for entrepreneurs who are wanting to take their practice to a deeper level. Love it. Love it. Okay. So I think we're ready to really get into it. And I'm just going to ask the question that is the topic of this podcast episode, which is cat does emotion have a place in business? And this is going to be like a lifetime, (laughs) lifelong conversation, I think. The short answer is yes. And the sort of more nuanced answer is when emotions show up in your business, can we lean into them as teachers? Mm -hmm. And so I think that you talked a little bit earlier about reactivity versus responsiveness Mm -hmm. And I think Mm -hmm. that that's where we have to do a little bit of the work is sorting out how much of this is reactivity and how much of this is responsiveness and how can we lean into more of a responsive way of, of, of our emotions. And that's not just for your business, but for all of the aspects in your life. I mean, conversations tend to go much smoother when you're responding versus reacting. Yeah. And businesses are no different, you know? If you are operating your business from a state of scarcity and fear and anger and just doing the action because it's the thing that you're supposed to do versus actually taking a a beat and looking internally and being like, okay, so what's, why is this showing up for me? Mm. You know, and can we alchemize this to into some form of intention so that the actions that we have are rooted in intention. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Totally. And I'm thinking of maybe we can get to like a practical example, because one of the messages that we talk about a lot on our Instagram channel or 
uh, what do we call that? Instagram page? I don't know. Instagram um, <laughs> is um, is not taking things personally. Mm. So I did a reel recently that was like, just ran through different scenarios. If your client's not paying you on time, if your client box at your prices, if like all these different things financially or not happen, you know, recognizing that it's not personal. But I'm wondering if maybe we could go a little bit deeper with that. Cause I think that's really just like scratching the surface mm-hmm. of, you know, I can only take that so far with my own training in any, you know, lack of training in, in this type of stuff. But so the Instagram only lets you like post like one minute at a time, <laughs> right. which is <laughs> right. like, right. how do we download the like, <laughs> all the answers of the universe in one minute, like, it's just not possible. <laughs> right, right. And, and part of the, what I wrote in that was, it's not personal. And so and so the point was like, you know, don't, uh, just recognizing that other people are going through their own stuff and they have their own baggage and issues and reasons why they're showing up like that. So try not to let it like uh, affect you, who you think you are or what your character is. But I think there's another side to that, which is, you know, if you're triggered by something and you are taking it personally, mm-hmm. one saying like, okay, that's their stuff. But also why am I taking this personally right yeah. now? Yeah. So maybe we could take an example. Do you have an example? Or I can throw some out there of like, you know, um, a client came back and said that the the cost of a project proposal was too high. Mm-hmm. And you get really upset about that because you worked really hard to get that price to where it was. And you know that you're worth, you, you thought at that moment, you know, you were worth it, but now you're questioning everything. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and emotions are going to come up there. And so maybe we can talk about it from that kind of practical level of like those emotions come up. How do we work with that? Yeah. Yeah. So with any of these practical examples, I think it's important to note that like we have to be a little bit general with it and everyone's individual experiences and everyone's individual histories are really different. And so I'm going to make a lot of assumptions about this particular hypothetical client. Okay. And, <laughs> um, and it might be different from your story, but it also, there might be some familiar strings attached to it as well. So let's say somebody has submitted this proposal, it's come back and they're saying it's way too expensive and it's slamming on what I'm hearing in that story is it's slamming on a lot of different wounds. It's slamming on rejection. It's slamming on, am I worth this? The self-value wound. It's slamming on resentment. So like I've put so much energy into this and they come back with this and like, they don't value my energy and what am I doing now with my life? Um, <laughs> resentment has a tendency to go to like, the, like extreme yeah. pretty quickly. <laughs> totally. I'm also hearing a lot of anger of like pushback of like, like, what do you mean? Right. Feeling into the scarcity piece as well of just like, if this client thinks that this is too much, then does that mean that the next four clients that I have, you know, meetings with in the future, it's going to, we're going to go down the same hole and do I need to lower my prices? And therefore I'm not going to be able to make rent. I'm not going to be able to feed my kids this month. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So (laughs) we can see how there's so much of your story that's being overlaid onto this interaction, this very simple interaction of this person saying, this is too much for me. Yeah. And uh, to your point, it may be bumping up against their own wounds around, I can't afford this. You know, I've put so much work into this project as well. And so therefore my energy is important too. And like, there's like, we can sort of see how the wounds are sort of playing with each other. Totally. And the first thing that I ask my clients to do when any sort of big reactive emotion is coming up in these spaces is, can we sit with that feeling for a moment? Mm. Instead of pushing it away, instead of distracting, instead of creating some form of disassociation around it, can or we solving with it? Yeah. Like trying to or solve, right? It. Yeah. That's what I always go to. Yeah. I'm feeling this way. Therefore, there must be something I have to fix or change about yes. myself right now. Yes. That's, yes. that's yes. typically where I personally go because I'm just a fixer changer. You know? Yeah. And, <laughs> and that's sort of like the classic anxious attachment style as well mm. is let me mold myself to every situation to make it more comfortable for everybody. 
because yeah. I'm so scared of separation. So therefore, I have to do everything within my power to make sure that I, there's no separation between me and my partner, this client, you know, this project, right? So yes, the first step is to slow down and not try to fix it and actually just lean into these feelings that we just named, right? And specifically, I ask my clients to name where they feel it in their body and what are the physical sensations that are coming up with that. Hmm. And when we do that, we start to see this is not the first time I felt this. Hmm. I felt this in a lot of different areas of my life. And when I ask the question, how old is this? How old is this feeling? Right? Like, if you're okay with it, like, if I ask you, how old is that feeling of needing to fix? Mm, it's young. Yeah. It's a young right. feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, this is where a lot of us go, is somewhere, it, it tends to go between these big transitionary phases in, in development, typically somewhere in the like four to eight-ish range. Mm-hmm. And then I hear a lot of folks who are, um, who say it's like in the like, teenage transitionary years. So like some 12 to 14 ish. Right. So that's where a lot of these messages and these patterns and these ways of being get ingrained in us is as our bodies are transitioning and as they're in a state of just instability, because that's the developmental phase that you're at, we have a tendency to take on a lot of these stories. And so when you take on the story of I have to fix this, that then becomes your survival pattern. And throughout your life, you may have had a lot of experiences and a lot of evidence that when you fix things, things get better. Mm -hmm. And now that you are in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, wherever you are, that strategy is not working for for you anymore. And we know it's it's not not sustainable, really, you know? Exactly. And so then it's about going in and asking that part of you and holding that part of you. And oftentimes this is hard to do on your own, which is why I think it's always helpful to work with a therapist, a professional, or just a friend who's really good at holding space for you. Mm -hmm. Going back and holding that young part of you and letting them feel safe, allowing them to have the space to feel those feelings that had been suppressed Because when suppression happens, then we hold them in our bodies until they're ready and like sort of sometimes inconveniently ready (laughs) to come out. (laughs) Um, And, and this is how we do that work. Right. And, and so that's sort of the tangible process of what working through these trauma knots that show up in business can look and feel like. And at the end of that, then you're able to say, oh, that's not actually about me. Mm -hmm. You know, that's actually about them. And I know what my worth is, and I'm going to stand firm on what I believe my value is. And Mm -hmm. it's okay. If that's not okay for them, they can find somebody else to do that project for them. It's wild how all of that can happen from like, one email, like a two sentence email. Thanks for sending this over. This is, this is a pretty out of our price range. Can we talk about this? Like a two sentence email. I mean, you can look at it two ways. One can be, oh, it can send you spiraling into this dark place or challenging place or whatever, which could be true. Or you could look at it as, huh, this is an opportunity for me to grow and Mm -hmm. learn more about myself in this moment. And so Mm -hmm. by like, by seeing, recognizing number one, you're having any kind of like emotional reaction to something Mm -hmm. is a great, what I'm hearing is a great place to start and, and kind of taking a beat before responding to that email or doing anything is just sitting and going, Hmm, I'm feeling really pissed off right now. I'm feeling angry at the moment. Yeah. That's what I'm feeling. (laughs) And how you know, old and is then that asking feeling? questions. Right. And then how old is that feeling? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how has that feeling served me in the past? Mm-hmm. Because that's where we get to a place where 
you know, anger might be the appropriate emotion. If they're saying, actually, like what I can afford is half this price and, you know, you have to do this project for me, like then anger is actually the appropriate emotion. Yeah. But even in that, can we sit in responsiveness instead of being like, what the, <laughs> you know? Um, totally. Like, can we sit in the seat of your of our own power and our own intentionality and respond to that email and say, you know, it doesn't sound like we're a good fit then. Right. You know? So let me ask you this. If you, in that moment, we have the luxury, if it's an email, of taking that moment and doing some work there. Mm -hmm. But what would you say if that is a live moment happening. You're on a call, you're sitting with someone and they say that and you don't necessarily, I mean, maybe you can, but how do you handle that when you're in the moment physically with this person? Mm -hmm. So one of the tools that I've developed like early on when I was trying to learn boundaries is because I was the kind of person who would say yes to everything. Like, yes, I can do this. And like, I have I am like the, an energy, an energizer bunny. And so like, I tend to have more energy than most people. So I can do those things. And what I have learned is I had to come up with a canned response of thank you for the request. I need to take X amount of time to think about this. Mm. It didn't even matter if it was like a friend asking me for a coffee date. Or if it was somebody asking me for a discount on my coaching services, just that simple, like canned response of, I need to take a moment to process this. And now I feel like I'm able to move through and respond because my nervous system feels safer now to like actually have those more confronting conversations but for somebody who's like earlier on in your sort of boundaries work, like starting with the baby steps of this is your training wheels and it's asking for time and space. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. Um, I like practicing these things. And this actually came up recently for me where I've been trying to break my phone habit, just trying to get away from my phone more. Mm -hmm. And man, that habit is powerful. And I have found that what's been really, really, really powerful and helpful for me in breaking this habit, and I'll circle back to what we're talking about here, is practicing in moments where it's not that big of a deal. So like we all have, I'm, I have said, I don't know this for sure, but I'm sure a lot of us have this habit of we hit a red light, we pick up our phone. Any moment where there's like this potential of like boredom or there's a, something to fill, we pick mm -hmm. up our phones. And yeah. so what I've been practicing is in those moments, not doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's like working the muscle. And so what I'm hearing from you is a great tool is practicing in way lower stakes, you mm -hmm. know, a coffee date with a friend or somebody's asking anything of you, very little thing and practicing saying, you know, let me, let me think about that. And I'll, let me get back to you on that. I'm not, I'm not sure right now what the right answer is, but I'm going to get back to you Yeah. and, and practicing in those moments so that when you are in a moment with a client where they're saying something like, this is way too much, what are we going to do about this? You mm -hmm. can say, Hmm. And, and I think this, this is another thing we talk about a lot on Kenza too, is practicing um, when you don't know the answer to something, especially as it relates to scope and money, and you're not like comfortable right there in that moment, just getting used to saying, let me take a look at it and get back to you. Yeah. It's so, so powerful, but it's, it's interesting how it goes so much deeper. You know, you're, I'm talking about that from like a very practical standpoint of not getting yourself into trouble with something. And you're saying that actually, no, that goes a lot deeper and tells your nervous system like, Hey, I'm standing up for you here and I'm giving us a moment yeah. <laughs> to, to consult Absolutely. our bodies, you know, and our minds and take a beat and be to your point before being, you know, proactive instead of reactive. Yeah. And, you know, your body has so much wisdom. Like there's in the years that I spent as an acupuncturist, this is like my big takeaway is that how much wisdom our bodies have. 
And in that moment that, you know, somebody's requesting a discount or somebody's saying that this is too much, you might feel a fuck yes or a fuck no from your body. Yeah. You know, and so can we take that information and discern if that's a reaction or if that's a response? And if it's a reaction, then that means that we have a little bit of work to do. And if it's a response, then like when you emailed me about like, can we talk about (laughs) emotions in business? And that was like a full (laughs) body fuck yes. You know, I didn't need to take a beat to like think about it and like, you know, where does it fit in my schedule? I was like, we're going to make it work. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's um, that's so interesting you bring that up because that's something I've been like just thinking about lately is, um, you know, building that trust muscle with ourselves. And that's that can be really challenging, especially so I think we talked in, in our other episode that we did about how I have um, thyroid disease, Hashimoto's, mm-hmm. and that can really mess with your hormones. And what's happened for me over the years is that I have lost trust in my reactions sometimes because I'm like, is this a hormonal reaction mm-hmm. or is this a real reaction? Mm-hmm. And trying to sort through that is challenging. Do you, do you have, like, how can we learn to trust our reactions a little bit more? Yeah. This is going to sound stupidly simple. <laughs> but it, <laughs> That's okay. really, it really does start with that fuck yes and fuck no from the body, you know, and the case of Hashimoto's, like there's a lot of hormonal things, but there's also a lot of like energetic things where like you get tired. Your thyroid is the thing that runs your energy and so, and metabolism. And so if you feel like, oh, I need to finish this project, but your body is saying, no, we need to take a nap. And you're like, no, 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 we're just going to override this. Right? (laughs) This is how we develop mistrust in our body because then your body's like, okay, I guess I have to turn my adrenals on. Here we go. Like (laughs) this kind of sucks, right? Yeah. Uh And, And so it's frustrating in the beginning because it's like, but how much rest does my body need? Exactly. Right? But you'll find that as you start rebuilding that relationship with your body and you start rebuilding that relationship with the sensations of your body and not overriding them in this, this would be a really good way to talk about like masculine and feminine energies in business as well. But if we can actually listen to that, then that's where our intuition comes through. Our intuition lives in our body. It doesn't live in our minds. Like when you get an intuitive hit, like it tends to come from the gut space, tends to come from womb space, from heart space. And so there's that like natural leaning forward that your body does when it's like, this is a yes Mm. and a natural Mm -hmm. retreat back when this is a no. And so the more that we can sort of use that muscle of fuck yes and fuck no, that's how we build trust with our bodies. And that's how we build trust with the intuition. Yeah, I love that. And I think that that's, you know, probably where, you know, a lot of like meditation work comes in is, you know, understanding your body and its different sensations and kind of playing with that, how that all sort of probably translates into all of what we're talking about here too, is like that practice. It's like, (laughs) you know, there's a reason why yoga is called a practice and meditation is called a practice because my understanding is that, you know, it's, it's, you're practicing for when these things happen in your life. You know, it's not just like, oh, you go meditate and it's like, oh, that was nice. I'm going to walk away now. It's like, no, no, that's helping you practice for when a situation does come up later in your day or your week. Yeah. So you can go back and go, oh yeah, remember, remember how I felt or remember what it feels like to be calm. Like go back to that, you know, you can get to that. And I think that, yes, that's all true. And I have a bit of a hesitation to just prescribe meditation, to prescribe yoga, because intention matters so much when it comes to this. Yeah. And I don't ever want to create another cycle of the to-do list energy with something that is meant to 
actually support us and restore us. And so again, this is where it goes back to the body is like some days my body says fuck yes to yoga. Yeah. (laughs) And some days my body says fuck yes to donuts. (laughs) And that is a practice is is listening to that. I think donuts can 100% be medicine as well. (laughs) Yeah. Totally. And, and so if we can listen to what our body needs and, and some days it's like my body wants to go and like, if I'm angry, the thing that I have to do is I have to go pick up heavy shit. Like I have to go lift weights. And so like in that moment that I'm angry, if you told me to meditate, that would be a fuck no for my body. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. My body wants to go pick up heavy shit. It wants to mm-hmm. go drive in the car and scream. Mm-hmm. It wants to go for a run it wants to pick a pillow fight with my boyfriend like (laughs) there are so many ways that we can access practices of self-care without it being like okay i'm having a, a moment where i'm feeling activated and my nervous system doesn't feel safe i need to go to yoga because that's the only tool in my toolkit right right and or and or that's what society or the people I follow or what I think I should be doing. I think that's something I, again, kind of going back to my own personal example of this like weird cycle I'm in right now of thinking like, Oh God, I'm doing everything right. Like I have my green smoothie. I'm eating well. I'm working out. I'm like getting a lot of sleep. I'm doing all these things that like I keep thinking are right. Mm -hmm. And yet here I still am. Yeah. And no like book about burnout, no great quote from Buddha, like nothing is really like penetrating that because clearly there's something else that my body is wanting from me that I'm like not finding yet. Yeah. And so I think it's just, you know, I love what you said earlier, like earlier, earlier in the conversation about like business being this spiritual practice and, and what I, what you said, I think was that, you know, our businesses can become our teachers, Mm -hmm. which is such an interesting thing to think about. And if we can look at our business from that perspective of, you know, our business is our teacher, that's really interesting to me. And that means that, okay, if there's something here that's coming up, maybe I can learn from that so that maybe it doesn't have to come up so often and so hard every time, you know? Yeah. And I think that this is where I have to think about business as being part of my DAO. And DAO is a word that has no translation in English. And even like, even in the concept of DAO, it's really hard to explain. <laughs> but I think that the easiest way that I've found to, to think about it is its purpose. And the way that Taoist medicine and my background in, in traditional Chinese medicine is it's all a matter of balancing yin and yang. And we have the aspects of both yin and yang within us. And this is not tied to gender, but an easy way for Westerners to understand these concepts is masculine and feminine energy. And the yin energy is feminine. And yin energy is like, she's the holder of intention. She's the holder of dreams. She is like the anchored root that sits still and chooses. Mm. And yang energy or masculine energy is gets the handoff of the intention from the feminine and is like, okay, I'm going to manifest this. I'm going to create momentum around this. Let me do this. And so it allows for the feminine part of you to be, and it allows for the masculine part of you to do. Hmm. And when both of those things come together, then we have the creation of Tao. And so like an example that I like to use is like such fundamental pieces that come together when a sperm and an egg meet. Mm-hmm. And so we used to think because we lived in a very masculine and patriarchal society that like, okay, so the egg just sits there 
<laughs> and then the sperm have this like competitive like jousting war to get to the egg and then the strongest one wins like how Just the visual of that is yeah. amazing <laughs> like sperm's jousting yeah. inside <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we used to think about you know conception and what we know now from science and from having these really beautiful microscopes and um you know being able to track the chemistry of what happens in conception is yes the egg sits there and she waits and she's scanning and feeling a resonance from each of the sperm around her and she is choosing she's the one who creates the opening so that the right sperm enters Wow, that's interesting. And so from the meeting of masculine energy, from the meeting of feminine energy, where the feminine is choosing the intentionality, then the catalyst is the masculine energy. And that's where life comes from. Hmm. Right? And so if we can expand that out into our Tao, if we can expand that out into who we were or how we were meant to embody our purpose in this life, it has to come from a seat of intention first. This place of, I am meant to experience love. I am meant to experience surrender. I am meant to experience freedom. And then having that ripple out into your life in the ways that you show up in your family, the ways that you show up in your business. And then that allows the masculine energy to have a direction and a purpose to like bring that into fruition. Mm. And what I'm seeing now is the way that we've been taught how to do business is very masculine driven without an intention behind it. It's growth for growth's sake. It's next quarter has to always make more than the previous quarter. It is not very connected. And so when you aren't able to connect with your clients, then there's exploitation that can happen on either end, Mm -hmm. right? There's a lack of value and purpose. And so this is why I think it's so important to like, I know it's a little bit esoteric, but this is why it's so important to actually listen to your emotions as they're coming through in your business, because it gives you a clue into what is not in alignment for you. And yes, it doesn't make logical sense to the masculine part of my brain because the masculine part of my brain is saying, we have to do the actions. We have to fix the things. We have to make sure that we're always busy and we're always activated and we're always like, like never bored. And the feminine is saying, no, we need to slow down and we need to anchor and root into our values so that every single action that we take has an intentional purpose behind it. And This is where I think we can prevent burnout in Mm -hmm. our businesses is I'm very, very busy in my business. I don't feel burnt out because I know that every single thing that I do is in alignment and there's no busy work around it. Yeah. Right. And so therefore every action that I take from my masculine is like, yes, this connects to a bigger picture of what I want my business to look and flow like. Mm -hmm. And that power comes from the feminine. And so that's where I think we need to be talking about Tao. We need to be talking about emotions in business because when we have this conversation around, don't get emotional. You're being a woman. You got to leave your anger at the door. Then what we're doing is we're saying we have to disconnect from our feminine and just let the masculine take over. Right. And when just the masculine takes over, then we end up in a relationship with our business that is either going to be very dictator-like, like I have to control all the things, Mm -hmm. Or you're going to end up in a business where it's like performative. So it's like, I have all these actions and look at all the things that I'm doing, but like, like you're just running on a treadmill. Right. 
Here at the Kenza Collective, we publish a weekly podcast, regular social media posts, we provide on-demand support to people in our free Slack community, and we create free resources and templates, all to support and encourage those of us brave parent entrepreneurs who are determined to reimagine what it means to be a working parent. This is very much a passion project for Beth and I, so your support on social media and spreading the word is greatly appreciated. If you'd like to support our work financially, allowing us to invest more time and resources into helping more parents just like you, please consider becoming a monthly supporter. Head to kenzacollective.com support to learn more or search the Kenza pod on patreon.com. Thanks so much for considering this. Now, back to the episode. So... I feel like I could just keep going with this for a long time and I just want to be mindful of time, but I do have, I have one more question and then we can shift gears a little bit, but, and and this is something that I personally struggle with. And so I'm, I'm assuming that other people may struggle with this too. I'm thinking they do. So, you know, going through this type of work and working on yourself and taking the steps to, you know, all the things we've been talking about, kind of taking a beat and, you know, maybe working with a coach, someone like you who can help help you understand this at a deeper level and move through it. I don't want to say faster, but maybe like more it's intentionally, faster. you know, faster. faster. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just don't want to make any promises, you know. Um, you know, there's all this stuff we can do. And then we confront the real world and we work with clients or on a team who is so far removed from any of these kinds of ideas, you know, Mm. not at all, you know, doing quote unquote, the work and, and maybe they are, but like from where you're seated, like it doesn't seem like it, you know? Um, And here's, here's a quick example. You know, we, I am co-CEO, I have a contract as a co-CEO of a tech company right now, software company. And there's some things going on with the other CEO, who's my dad, um, that are preventing the business from moving as fast as maybe people would like it to. Mm. And I've tried sort of, there's some pretty big issues going on. I have family stuff going on and I've tried being very kind of upfront and bringing a little bit of this like humanity and emotion into the business with these other, with other people on the team and saying, Hey, you know, I'm going to level with you. This is kind of what's going on. And I'm going to ask for some empathy here. And, and it's just, it lands wrong. It's not quite there. It's like, how do we bridge this gap between where we are, what we're trying to cultivate, who we're becoming in the world where that's not where people are and like you're meeting resistance and it's frustrating and you're like, come on, you know, like that messy part is so challenging sometimes because you can't change people and I don't want to judge them, but it's like, do you just walk away from that? But you're kind like, of judging them. Yeah. There. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Right. So I know that was kind of like a bleh, but no, I get it. that's not a bleh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you've done the first step, which is you can't change other people. Like that's an important thing to realize and recognize on anyone's personal development journey. And So then the next question becomes like, how do I want to participate? And so that, that's again going to be a different journey for anyone who's listening. So for me, my level of participation was I worked in a broken medical system and the clinic that I was working at before 2020 advertised in a way that brought in people looking for a fix. And so I have a tendency to categorize my clients in four different areas of like consciousness. So like in any sort of like market research, we have a tendency to like look at the demographics of people, right? Like for Kenza, you know, they have a certain level of income. They are entrepreneurs. They are parents. Like we sort of like tick off these boxes. Mm -hmm. But for me, what is more important is like what level of consciousness are they at? And so the categories that I, that I teach are there's the asleep person, there's the aware person, there's the awake person, and then there's the integrated person. And when we're talking to asleep and aware people, they have a tendency to be really focused on result. Like they want the outcome. They think this is going to fix them if they're asleep, or they think that this is going to fix the problem if they are aware. Whereas people who are on the awake and integrated sides 
are able to see that, oh, the problem is not actually the problem. And the process is more about the journey of how to get there and the lessons that we're going to learn along the way. And we may end up learning something entirely different than what we signed up for. Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, the sovereign choice that I made after sitting with my feminine was I don't want to participate in a system in the medical system that I see as being broken and I can't fix that from the inside out. So I'm going to step away and I'm going to create my own business and be only working with people who are aware and awake. And that's not to say that that's the choice for everybody because I have some really great friends who are doing amazing work within the system. And that is more aligned with their Tao because they are more in tune with the teachings that need to come through in that space. And they don't get frustrated in the ways that I got frustrated. And so to bring it back to your example of a team. So how do we participate within the context of a team where there's likely a scattering of people along this spectrum of consciousness? And so you're going to be speaking to somebody who's asleep in a very, very different way from how you're going to speak to somebody who's very awake Mm-hmm. And so trying to speak to an asleep person with the language of awakeness is like, there's going to be a fucking chasm miles long. Right. <laughs> that literally just happened. Yeah. Like just happened. So it's yeah. just very interesting timing. Yeah. And so, it just didn't land, you know? Yeah. It doesn't it just land. It does not land. Even because though you're, you're like, I literally just explained it to you. Yeah. But four days later, you're more angry asking the same question. I'm like, but I just, what? <laughs> Nothing's changed. Yeah. Because you're speaking from your perspective of having done all that work. Yeah. Right. And so like, this is how I teach marketing actually is, can you meet the person at point A and help them feel seen, heard, and understood in that space. And then express, these are your thoughts being at point B. And how can we create a bridge together Mm -hmm. to bridge that gap and invite them? We can't, we also can't force them like as a recovering type A Um, anxious attachment style person. Like I just want to control all the things like Uh what you can do is invite them into an alternate perspective and see if they come along that journey with you. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that this is how we are going to change these patterns of toxic capitalism immature masculine patterns, immature feminine patterns, and be pattern breakers in company cultures, in family cultures. Yeah. Is like, if you're wanting empathy, like practicing that empathy for the other person as well, and seeing if that helps their nervous system feel safe enough to actually mirror that back. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. Yeah, it does. And then, you know, I think the other thing is that as business owners, we have choices, you know, and we have a choice like you did to choose not to work with a certain type of person or a certain demographic, which I know you and I have talked about before, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, a certain type of business. People mm-hmm. talk about niching in and, you know, maybe we need to be thinking about that from like an energetic standpoint. Like maybe you don't need to niche into nonprofits. Maybe you want to niche into working with people who are doing this type of work and are are this kind, you know, on, on a conscious level, um, you know, aware, yeah. awake, or, you know, whatever it is you want to be in. And, and see what happens when you switch your, your niche or your attention to that internally. You yeah. know, I don't know if you would really put that on your website. Like I only work with conscious people. So <laughs> no, <reach> <laughs> but the language matters. <laughs> right, right. Right. And so like when, you know, this is one of the things that we go through in my business alchemist mentorship program is once you've identified 
the kind of person that you want to work with, both psychographically and demographically, learning how to speak to that person is going to be very different. Yeah. You know? And so like a very tangible example is I don't post reels. Like that's just not a thing that I do. I know that the algorithm says that it's good for you. And like every once in a while I'll post a reel, but it's really like, here's a pretty scene. And like, these are the thoughts that I'm having in this pretty scene, but I don't do the like dancing. I don't do yeah. the like one minute head, like tidbit of like value that people are putting out. I don't do that. Totally. Because the people who are in the aware, awake categories are going to be okay sitting down and watching a five to 10 minute video on Instagram about like some deeper topic. Totally. And so how you speak to those people, like if you're somebody who posts a ton of reels, you're going to have to expect that there are going to be a lot of people who are in this sleep category who are coming to you and asking for some support and advice. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't have to be this like, yeah, I only work with awake people. Like the way that you present yourself is going to resonate with different people and allow right. different people in. Right. Right. So I want to, you mentioned your um, business alchemist group and program. Can you tell us about that? And one thing I'm curious about specifically is what that name means, why you chose business alchemist. You know, what's that? You don't hear that word a lot. And that mm -hmm. always has stuck out to me mm -hmm. when I interact with your brand, that mm -hmm. word alchemy alchemist. Um, you just don't see that a lot, especially in this space. So maybe you can tell us where that came from and then just segue into what is that program? Yeah. I think about trauma work as being alchemy. And so I started calling myself an emotional alchemist coach because what I started seeing is that when we lean into these hard, challenging emotions, instead of burying them, they tend to alchemize and become a force that we can work with and learn from rather than mutating. Mm, and okay. so like, if you squish anger down, it shows up in like your partner forgets to do the dishes and you're like in this place where it's like, you don't recognize how much work I do and like nobody's valued me. And you know, like that's, that's what a mutation of an emotion looks like. Right. And when we alchemize that anger in the moment that you're feeling it, then it doesn't have to be this way. It can just mm -hmm. be, they forgot to do the dishes and it pissed me off. And can we do something about it? And also remembering sometimes I forget to do the dishes too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and I don't need someone in my house yelling at me because I forgot to do the dishes one yeah, time. I exactly. always think about that. Whenever yeah. I like, if I, if I like pause, I'm gonna get mad at Spencer for something. I'm like, would I appreciate someone in my house coming up to me and being like, rah, 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 you yeah. didn't do the, like, you know, yeah. no, <laughs> put your socks away. Like, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's the same for business, right? So a lot of the people who come to me either, like I have two kinds of folks that I've been working with lately, which is I've just gotten out of my coaching certification or I've just like had this like amazing idea for a product. I don't know what to do with it. So can we alchemize that beautiful intention into some form of action, right? And then I have the other kind of client who's like, I have a bajillion followers on Instagram, but I'm basically volunteering at my job. Like I'm like, it's not making me any money, even though it looks like on the outside, I have all this success. Right. Yes. And so can we alchemize that into something that actually sustains and nourishes you? Right. And so what we do is we go through a nine month process and it's rooted in the cycles of nature. And so we we go through essentially the five seasons according to Taoist medicine. So we start in the metal season, which is autumn. And so that's really about clarifying. So we talk about what does your brand stand for? What is your actual personal Tao? I take people through a meditation and we uncover one word that is your personal Tao. And from there, we sort of build in what what do you want to talk about with your people? How do you want to talk about with your people? And 
like get to a really clear place in that metal season. And then we move into winter, which is about water and rooting down. And so now that you've got all this clarified energy, let's get still and get really intentional about what kind of offerings you want to be putting out there. You know, what kind of people you want to be drawing in. And then we go into wood, which is um, spring energy. So that's when we sprout. And so that's where we start seeing things sort of manifesting on the outside. And so we talk about Mm -hmm. how to launch. But like before we can get into the how-tos of like spring and beyond, we have to do that internal work of autumn and winter of like rooting down and, and getting really clear with the feminine. Right. Yeah. And so in the springtime, we launch, we, t- I, we talk about how to launch, we talk about marketing, we talk about content and copy and sort of the more like tangible how to type things. Right. And then in the summer, we talk about connection. So a lot of times we can get really caught into codependent cycles with our clients and with our business as well. Mm-hmm. I tend to think about business as an entity, as a person. And so when we sort of contextualize it like that, then we start seeing like, oh, this person's making me really pissed off or this person's creating a lot of resentment for me. And so how do we break away from that kind of relationship, even if it's a intangible entity, right? Yeah, that's interesting. Personifying the business. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then we go into earth and... Uh, late summer energy, which is where I get to collaborate with you all because we're going to talk about harvest. And so Mm. once we've put these things externally, like what are the systems that we need to put into place to make sure that everything runs smoothly on the back end? And this is where I think I'm so excited to collaborate with Beth and you because I bring in sort of like the spirit and like, let's talk about the energetics of money. But then Beth is going to ground that with the masculine practice of here's the structure. Like, like we, we need both, right? So we need our money to work for us, but then also we need to create a safe space so that the money feels like you can use it in ways that are both sustainable and directed. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute. So that program sounds amazing. Um, you are currently in kind of the middle of one right now. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, I'm only going to be offering it once in 2022. And so the doors for that will open in August, but between now and August, we have two workshops that we'll be hosting in June. It's the middle of June, right? Uh, we're going to do a workshop with Kenza Collective, and it's going to be about the energetics of money. And so we'll talk about how our subconscious belief systems prevent us from actually accessing and receiving and using money in ways that are intentional and how we can use ourselves as a conduit for um, how money participates in capitalism. And then Beth is going to teach us some accounting skills, which I'm really excited about personally, because I need some skills there. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and I love how we got to explain that masculine, feminine, yin and yang kind of energy and that whole picture I have in my mind of jousting sperm, (laughs) Um, but not that. (laughs) Because that is a really cool way, I think, of looking at these workshops. So just to back up, these workshops are available to her current cohort, but she is opening them up to the public. So you, dear listener, are going to be able to sign up for them. They're kind of weekend intensives um, and super affordable, under $200, right? Um, and you're going to get so much out of it. And what's so cool is going back to that description of yin and yang is that you know, really in, in our workshop with the energetics of money, like Beth is really going to be like you were saying, kind of that masculine energy of like actually taking and doing, and then you're going to be kind of there as someone who's making sure that people are staying like really rooted and, and analyzing maybe some feelings that are coming up for them as we, you know, as we talk about a budget, let's, let's create a budget. What does that mean? You know, you might have feelings that some resistance or some, yeah 
frustration or some tuning out or all kinds of things might come up. And what's really cool is that Kat's going to be there to um, answer the questions or address those or talk through that before we even get into it. It's going to be such a like a, a perfect demonstration of what you're trying to do, Kat, what you're trying to teach people in a larger context of running your business from being really rooted and grounded in that feminine energy, but then also being able to take action. <laughs> and um, I just think it's really cool how, you know, it's no accident that this all came together like this cat, you know, like the question of does emotion have a place in business was in an episode we recorded a long time ago. And I'm, I pause right there because I'm realizing something else really cool that happened is the person we recorded that with the first episode it got ruined. Like all these technical issues happened. It was so crazy. The whole episode was like, we were struggling to record that episode. Just so many glitches happened. And then we thought we got it and she had had to switch to her phone and then her phone died. And it like somehow, some way that recording was completely just lost. Yeah. So we had to redo it. And Mm -hmm. then the redoing is the question that came up. Mm. Does emotion have a place in business? And then that's what spurred this. And then you and I are collaborating on the, um, and Beth are collaborating on the energetics of money. And it's just, it's really cool to kind of like see the universe collaborating and conspiring yeah, in this like, way. Poke, poke. You should do <laughs> yeah. this. Poke, poke. Yeah. 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 And just so people get a sense of what those weekend intensives are going to feel like is I really want to hold the intention of it being a really interactive process for people, even if it's going to be a bigger group. And so Beth is going to be able to tangibly walk you through and give you tools that you can use right away in your business, regardless of where you are in the process of like building out your financial health of your business. And I will be actually doing live coaching with folks who feel comfortable with that, because I think that, you know, you're so good at rooting this in tangibles, because when we are able to hear someone else's story, It's not 100% like our own, but in that process of working through that block, there may be some gems in there for you, or you may actually be the one in the hot seat. Right. So it's going to be not just like, we're going to throw and slam some information at you. Like it's going to be a very interactive, intimate process. um, And I'm really, really excited to be able to do that through our friendship and our relationship. Yay. Okay. So where can people find you and follow you and get involved in all the amazing work that you're doing? Yeah. So everything with my brand is Empowered Curiosity. So Instagram, I'm on at Empowered Curiosity. Uh, My website, which is undergoing a big overhaul right now is um, empoweredcuriosity.com. And the podcast is Empowered Curiosity Podcast. And you can find us on Apple and Spotify and all the places that you normally find podcasts. Yay. And then um, also check out the show notes for a link to um, the landing page about these workshops so that you can sign up um, depending on when you hear this episode. And when you click on that, you'll either be able to add your name to a waiting list or you might be able to just go ahead and buy your spot in the workshop. So um, check out the show notes for that information, everything else we talked about here. Um, And definitely go follow Empowered Curiosity on Instagram and all the places. Um, Check out her podcast. Thank you, Kat, for joining us and for sharing such great wisdom as always. We really, really appreciate your time. And um, thank you for the great work that you're doing out in the world. It really is going to change things. It is changing the way business is run and the way, you know, we are able to live our lives. And that's really, really important, great work. So thank you for doing that.